this is all about posture that I'm talking about today. When you come before God with prayer and, and, and trust that he will hear you or you believe he will hear you, then you got to get some things right uh, in the process. So we got to make sure uh, we understand the posture that we should be in. And the first thing we definitely need to make sure of is how we view God and how we view God's holiness. Amen. I got this up here because, I mean, come on. This is, what, this is the way this new generation views God. They, they think God, they think Jesus is their homie. Prayer is critical in the times we are living in. The devil seeks to keep us from praying by causing us to approach prayer the wrong way. 1 Timothy 2 and 8 says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. Okay, so let's break this particular scripture down. So men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. What is lifting up hands? This is a surrender or a recognizing of the power or the authority that you are approaching when you lift your hands, right? Many of y'all been, you know, the law, amen. Some of you had confrontations with the lawman, amen. And so you had to lift your hands when he said, uh, get the hands. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. You better not reach for a brush or a comb. You better get them hands up there. Amen. And try to march and protest. You better get them hands up. Amen. So he says, lifting up holy hands, which is a sign of surrender. This is a sign of I recognize that I am before the God of all gods. I'm, I'm before an authority greater than mine. And so he says, lift up holy hands. But then these, these two things right here. Oh, this is why a lot of people can't get their prayers answered. And, you know, that's the... Out of all the emails and all the correspondence I have, I would honestly say that the one that, that what I get the most is, why aren't my prayers being answered? I pray. I do pray. And I ask, are you praying? You talking to the Lord? I do pray. I do. Well, why are my prayers not being answered? God never answers my prayers. Well, maybe you're praying the wrong thing. That would be the first thing. Or maybe there's wrath in your heart or there is doubting in your heart. So maybe, and, and this wrath one is, or uh, anger. Anger is the opposite of, the, or, or it opposes God when you are angry. Because when you're angry, you're not being honest with the reason you are really praying. Does that make sense? So you can't have wrath in your heart or be angry towards someone or you're going to say things based on the way you're feeling instead of what should be said. This is why he said, when you stand praying, forgive. That your prayers can be answered. You got to get the wrath out of your heart. If you are angry, that means you're holding on to something someone did. You're holding on to something someone did. You can't pray to a God and expect that God to let go of what you did. Oh, Lord, I, I know I just preached. I could end this right now. But yeah, without, so, so he says, without rout, a, a wrath or doubting, and doubting is sometimes translated as another word, but here we're going to use doubting. But without wrath is the important part of this particularly, because we know when we pray, we have to believe that God is who he says he is. But the wrath part, it needs to be removed from your heart. You have to remove the wrath because the wrath suggests that someone did something that is not worthy of forgiveness. And if they've done something not worthy of forgiveness, then you aren't worthy of forgiveness. So your whole posture, your whole approach is wrong. You could pray for 10 years and never receive anything you pray for, all because you are harboring wrath or anger in your heart towards someone else. And it's causing you to not get your prayers through because you're expecting God to do something for you that you won't do for your brother. We must make sure we are in the correct posture for praying and understand who we are talking to. Ooh, understand who you're talking to. Society has dumbed down who God is in our minds. They have TV show, Black Jesus show. Then they got TV show, God and, 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 and uh, uh, Bruce Almighty and all these where God is, um, uh, what's Morgan Freeman? I mean, he, is, he might be as old as God, but... Morgan Freeman is God, and they just got God on all these shows, and they're just acting, you know, just, just, just making fun or, 
are, are bringing God down to a human level. And the more we see it, the more we start thinking that God is this. And then they start coming out with these songs and these raps and different things, the way they're saying his name and, you know, yeah, you know, Jesus, yeah, yeah, my man, my boy, you know, just talking like he's a human being. And he's not. He is God. And so that respect level has to be there when you approach him. He said, if any man come to me, he must first believe that I am who I say I am. Who am I? Well, when, when the men in the Bible approach him, take your shoes off. When Moses saw him, his whole countenance changed. When the people saw him, stuff caught on fire. We're talking about the God of all gods. That reverence level and that reverence. And, and here's the thing. You don't want to bring God down to your level and make him like you or you won't get what if, if you won't get what it is you're praying for. You can do that if you're just going to have a human version that you need. But the problem is a lot of people are without fathers or a lot of people are without leadership. They're without authority in their home. So they try to take God and turn him into that. Or they want God to be their earthly father as well as their heavenly father. And it doesn't translate that way. God is God of all. He is sovereign God of all. He knows all. All things that happen, he knows before they happen. You don't surprise God. God knew it was going to happen. When God called you, he knew what you would do. And once he calls you, you will live until your call is complete. Why? Because he's God. Society has dumbed down who God is in our minds. We almost see him as equal to us or on our level. And this was done on purpose by the devil because he wants you, he wants, and that was the thing. When, 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 even when the devil tempted Jesus and, and tried to uh, uh, tempt Jesus in the wilderness, the Bible said that the devil leveled the playing field. How did he do it? He began to quote scriptures. Now think about this. You're the devil. How are you quoting scriptures to the word? Why was he doing that? He was trying to show that, hey, man, I know the word too. We basically brothers. You know what I'm saying? He's trying to do that Mormon stuff. We, we basically brothers anyway, right? And Jesus made sure you knew the order because he said, get behind me, Satan. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God with all thy heart. Get behind me, meaning I'm going to show you the heavenly hierarchy right now. You are behind me. We're not equal. But that's what a lot of people do. They try to, you know, do what the devil did and try to, to try to act like, you know, hey, uh, you know, God, I mean, I'm, you know, I just call him up. I just ask. Matter of fact, I'm the, I, I saw a video of a dude talking to the Lord on the phone, on the cell phone. What you say, Lord? She's where? Where, where is she? I mean, he did a whole, and the people was going crazy. Ah! Oh, he's talking to Jesus. Isaiah 40 and 28 says, Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, now let me tell you, everlasting God means that he is God with no time. So he's, God is greater than time. He was God before Time, he's going to be God after time. Time rests inside of God. So he's, this is Isaiah describing him, that everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, meaning the, as far as east is to west. Well, we know as far as east is to west, there is no ending to that. So he's creator of the ends of the earth. He fainteth not, meaning he never gets tired. There's no tiredness in him. Neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding, meaning you will never figure him out. You will never figure God out because our minds are finite. And our minds aren't a replica of God's mind. There is no way we can understand God's mind. So we can't bring him down to the level of a homeboy and a road dog and a boon coon. He's greater than all of that. And so we shouldn't even try to put those labels on him. When we're approaching him, we're approaching him as the everlasting God. Modern-day believers tend to approach God too casually and without reverence and fear. Isaiah 6 and 5, then said, woe is me. Now, this is Isaiah approaching. Now, Isaiah is a great prophet. Isaiah was the voice of Israel at this time. 
And he said, woe is me. Once he saw God, he says, woe is me for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. So once he saw the king and the Lord of hosts, he shrunk down to see just how filthy we are as humans and how nothing we are. And this is the posture you come before God in. You come before God knowing that he is a great God and there is woe unto you. This is why there should always be repentance and asking for forgiveness and asking for searching of your heart. When you come before God, search my heart because I don't want to be a man of unclean lips standing before you. I don't want to be a man that's in the midst of people with unclean lips. Fearing God is not being afraid to approach him, but it is a fearful reverence of his holiness and how wicked we really are. Amen. You know, I grew up in a church where folks would compete to show how saved they were. You know, it was almost like testimony service was a competition for folks to show the wonder-working power that God had bestowed upon them. And they would get up and testify, and, and, and each one, you know, they'd be looking at the other and, and let, me, let, let, let me go. Can, can I go? Okay, let me tell you what the Lord did for me, you know. You know, today a piano fell out of the sky and missed me by three centimeters. Not a string or a key hit me. God is a good God. Amen. Amen. And then the next person sitting down says, is it my turn? Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Two pianos. And folks competing to try to show what you know, you know, what, what what's going on. And and we're not good as human beings. We can try our best, which is what we should be doing. Presenting our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. That's your reasonable service to do your best. But you still had thoughts that day that you shouldn't have had. Amen. Amen. And we, we don't act on them. We try best not to act on those thoughts. But even the fact that you had the thoughts, Jesus said that those thoughts are sinful. See, you sin by thinking it. Because that's where it starts anyway. Amen. Don't nobody just show up in the club. Hey, man, who put this uh, sexy dress on me and how did I end up in here? Nobody just pop up. Pop up in the club. Who unbuttoned all my buttons and got my taco meat showing? <laughs> It just happened. I don't even know where this shirt came from. I mean, what, what happened? I just, no, no, no. It starts, with, <laughs> it starts with thoughts. You thought it first. Amen. Friday night, you started thinking Monday. Amen. Monday. Tuesday, you went to the men's collection. You know, this is, I'm, I'm really getting an Easter suit. You know, you in KNG talking about an Easter suit. You know, the, oh, they out of suits. Well, I'll just take a wide collar shirt. Yeah, where the buttons end right here. You know, you was already prepared. Tuesday came. Wednesday. <laughs> Wednesday, Thursday. And you know, when you planning to act a fool, you can't pray. You ain't prayed since Sunday. Because you planning to clue. <laughs> You plan to go to the club. Well, I'm just not going to think about it till Thursday. <laughs> but it all starts with your thoughts. Amen. And that's what Jesus said. Jesus said, if you, if, if you look upon a woman and lust after her, you've already committed adultery in your heart. So you got to be careful with your thoughts. So our thoughts need repentance of. So when we come before God, we got to make sure that our thoughts, today I may have thought something that I shouldn't have been thinking. Amen. Somebody made you mad and cut you off and you, oh, you old big bald headed. And you thought death and murder. All the way home, you just thought, you just heard the ghetto boy song playing. You thought death and murder all the way home. And so that night, well, that morning, whenever you get before God, you got to get forgiveness for that. You have to bring that up. You can't hide that from God. So this is fearing God or reverence of his holiness. We, we must come to grips with the fact that we are nothing and our actions are selfish and sinful. Amen. We don't even take a position of judgment against one another. 
because that's sinful too. We're judging people, and the Bible said we've done the same things. So we just have to be really careful. All these things have to be repented of. Proverbs 9 and 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Now, this is deep right here. The knowledge of the holy, understanding who God is and understanding his holiness, understanding his position in the world, understanding where he stands versus where we stand. That's his holiness or understanding, and this will give us understanding. So we'll know when we come before him, no, I can't ask for that. That's selfish. I can't ask for that. That's superficial. I can't ask for that. That's just material. I can't ask for that because I'm just worried about what somebody thinks. I can't ask for that because I'm just worried about what somebody's going to say. I can't ask those things to a holy God. I need to pray his will out of his holiness. That's how you get your prayers answered. Amen? God gave us Jesus to make us clean and wash us so that we can be presented holy and acceptable in his presence. But we cannot continue in the old way that we used to live. This practice crucifies Jesus over and over again. Romans 12 and 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. So you can't do this without mercy because you're not going to get it all right all of a sudden. It's going to take some time. So you have to have the mercy of God to cover your sins along the way. As you're learning this, as you're learning to come before God, him making you clean, him washing you. You know, I don't understand, and the church got off on this, and I understand salvation and accepting uh, Christ into your heart and becoming a believer. But after that, the work is not done. It's not over. You don't take that. And, you know, they used to get up and testify, oh, with, you know, the, the, I, I met the Lord uh, one night, and everything was all right, and I'm good, and I'm saved from now on. Boy, if you don't get in that word, and if you don't hear, your faith is going to be tested. And when your faith get tested, you're going to fail. In 20 and 20, right now, folks, faith is being tested. And many are falling away. Why? Because you didn't have anything. You went off what someone said. You went off grandmama's prayers. You went off whatever, whatever you were going off. Of. You didn't have the word take root in your heart. You thought it was a one-time event, and I'm good. I sat in the chair. I joined the church, and now I'm good because I'm around church folks. No, that's not enough. This has to get inside of you. It has to be nourished. And you can't continue in the old way that you used to live. You have to learn, and you have to present your bodies a living sacrifice. So the, uh, he says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your body, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So this is a perpetual thing. You continue to present your body a living sacrifice. It's not like a dead sacrifice. You kill the ox and lay him on the brazen altar or whatever, and you burn him, he's gone. He ain't going to jump back up for another sacrifice. Okay, I'm over here if you need me. No. <laughs> I don't know why I did that. But... <laughs> That, it's over once he's burned, but a living sacrifice means that you have to keep dying. Does that make sense? That's Romans 12 and 1. When we approach his presence, we must make sure we are not hiding from him. Oh, this is a big one. Though we are sinful beings, we are loved by him, and we must truly love him in return. So understand, because he loved us so much, he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever shall believe it on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's how much he loves us. He loved us before we were even born, before he framed the world. He loved us. He loves his creation. So we are loved by him. Even though he's great, he's mighty, he's powerful, he's terrible, he's awesome. All of these things that the Old Testament describes him as, he yet loves us. And he loves us and he wants a relationship with us. I tell people all the time, he loves us enough to come back for us. He's the only, we're the only thing. We're the only reason Jesus is coming back to the earth. He's coming back for us, the ones that he loved, the ones that he died for. He proved his love to us. Amen? But because he loves us, he wants us to love him in return. If we continue or if we wish to commune, with him. So he wants love in return. Hebrews 4 and 13. And no creature is hidden from his sight. So listen, 
You don't hide things from people that you love. This is why the enemy comes and attacks young people when you were very young. He came in your life. Some kind of violation happened, showed you something you shouldn't have seen. Something happened to you. Somebody did something they shouldn't have done. Whatever. What he was doing, it wasn't so much about the act that he was uh, uh, perpetrating on you. It was to put you in secrecy. He was building secrecy in you so that you would have something to hide. Once you learn how to hide something, you'll grow up understanding how to lie and hide. Yeah, and so that's why, you know, molestations and, and violations and different things happen to us when we're very young because he wants to build that secrecy up, that shame to speak on it. So you will learn how to go be, in, be there with your family, have a good time, laugh and joke and play and everything. And then when you're by yourself in the middle of the night, you're crying, thinking about what was done to you, but you won't tell anyone. The devil is building an area in your heart of secrecy so that you'll hide. As you get older, you'll begin to master the art of hiding that because you never told anyone. So then you begin to come before God praying with something hidden. And when you have something hidden and you come before the God who sees everything, you're lying. Then you wonder why your prayers aren't being answered. Why God is it? Because there's something you're keeping from him. And so when we approach his presence, we must make sure we aren't hiding from him. And everybody's done this. So don't be looking like, oh, now who would hide from God? You've done it. We've all done it. We've come before God with stuff that we needed to confess to him that we didn't confess to him. And our prayers didn't get answered. He didn't listen. He covered his ears. Like, I don't want him that you got to say until you tell me about what happened. Amen. You tell me about that trip to the men's collection, about that shirt you had on Friday night. Until we talk about the shirt, don't be asking me for no rent. Asking me to get your car and all those old foods that we be asking him for. The, the <laughs> oh, I need a breakthrough. I need a breakthrough. No, you need to button that shirt up. That's some foolishness. You got to come clean with the Lord. That's love. But at an early age, the devil taught you how to love with secrets. That's what it is. You learn to love with secrets. Some of y'all got married with secrets. Telling the person how much you love them with secrets. And this is because you learned that at a young age, how to be with your family, how to be with everyone, how to be happy, how to do all of this with secrets. So then you come before God. You can't come before the almighty God that sees and knows everything, beginning and the end, made you, created you, and hide from him. Though we are sinful beings, he loves us, and he wants to commune with us. But no creature is hidden from his sight, according to Hebrews 4 and 13. But all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Everything is exposed to him. Ain't no skeleton falling out your closet and God be like, whoa. He knows everything. He saw you when you put the skeleton in there. Amen. So there's nothing hid from him. So we have to come clean to God. If we don't, then it's not true love. True love gets grossly distorted by our self-loving narcissistic society which makes love superficial and based on receiving instead of giving. But this love doesn't work with God because it, it is absent of trust and true commitment. He wants the true commitment and the trust. Do you trust God enough to empty your heart out to him? Do you trust him enough to tell him and show him who you really are when you come before him? John 14 and 21, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him and will mm, manifest myself to him. What are you praying for? You're praying for things? You're praying for success? You're praying for something you can see? No, 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 no. You should be praying for him to manifest himself to you. This is the goal. When we say we love him, we must be willing to give up our desires for his. 
This is true love. You're going to give up what you want to do, your desires, for his. The desire to prove ourselves to others must be removed, and we should desire to only please him. That is much easier to preach and say than it is to do. But God wants to be your only desire. He wants what he desires to be what you desire. Delight thyself in me, and I will give you the desires or give your heart what to desire. 1 John 3 and 22. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. But see, what's the secret? What's the secret, pastor, to praying? What's the secret to receiving? What's the secret to getting from God? I mean, the things that you get down and pray, the things that you speak to him about. What is the secret? What's the secret? Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. What's the secret? The secret is no secret. He said, keep his commandments and do what pleases him. If you want to receive from him, you're not going to receive from him doing what you want to do. This is hard to do in today's world because everything points to our own satisfaction and attention. But accepting the pain of our cross requires humility. What did the cross symbolize? Humiliation, humbling, and being brought low. That's what the cross Brought low unto death. That's what the cross symbolizes. So we have to accept the pain of our cross. We all have a cross. And that includes bringing ourselves down, humiliation, humbling, being brought low in our eyes. When we come before God, we should be humiliated, humbled, and brought low just by his glorious, wondrous, perfect presence. Luke 9 and 23, and he said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. And this is the one. Take up his cross every day, humbling, brought low every day, and follow him. This is how you get your prayers answered. Summary. I mean, if nothing else, this pandemic should have humbled you. This pandemic should have shown you that in the blink of an eye, everything can be changed. This pandemic ought to show you that, man, they, can, they are controlling everything. Got folks driving around in cars wearing masks and shields in a car. Folks in a restaurant. They serving you with mask on, but everybody in there eating got to take the mask off. That's not logical. That makes no logical sense. Got a plexiglass covering you, but they're taking your money, touching everything in there, and then handing it back to you. Why is there a shield? Y'all, this is not logical, but they're, they're able to do whatever they want to get their will accomplished. That ought to humble you and let you know unless we believe in the power of God and we serve under the true and living God, we would be some miserable folks and we'd be just as afraid. But we have peace because we know how this ends. Amen? Look at somebody and say, we win. Many of our prayers are not being answered today because we are in the wrong posture when we are praying, we come to God as deserving and entitled to the things we ask for, not considering the sins we have committed and the pain we have caused others. We cannot believe that God is going to continue to do for us without us doing for him. What kind of relationship is that? But that's a narcissistic relationship. That's what's happening now. Folks are just that narcissistic. They want you to do for them without them doing for you. But that's not the way it works with God. We can't expect him to do for us. You can't pray to him about what you want, but you haven't talked to him about what he wants. Even though he is a forgiving God, that doesn't change the fact that we are sinful beings and need his regenerative power every day of our lives. This means that even though we can come boldly before him, we must acknowledge the need for him 
and his what? Regeneration. Every day we have to acknowledge that we need his regeneration. And I know, you know, I grew up in church and you know, I've been to a few churches where folks just thought that they, they had it down. Been saved all day. No evil have I done. You just did evil singing that. Because we can look at your lips and tell you don't like the, the, the church mother over there to the right. Saved all day. Yeah. And folks think because you're not shooting and looting no more. You're not homosexualizing and, and lusting no more. You think you've arrived. But you're hating. You got anger. You got malice. You're jealous. You have envy. All of these things are on the same list. So you need forgiveness. God will speak to us and lead us if we are in the right posture before him. But if we practice sin and attempt to excuse our behavior by any other means than through his regeneration, then we will not receive what we pray for. We must ask in faith, forgiving others and being forgiven. We must not ask amiss to heap it upon our lust. We must be cleansed and attempting to live a clean life. If we hide sin or live a sinful lifestyle, our posture is incorrect and our prayers will go unanswered. John 15 and 5, he says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. And if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Listen to this, people. If ye abide in me, and my word abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will. And what's going to happen? It shall be done. This is the posture for prayer. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, then when you pray and you ask the things in prayer, it will be done. Why will it be done then? Because it will be of his words that you're asking. Because those words are now in you. Amen? Father God, we just thank you, Lord, for this word. I thank you, God, for just this insight on prayer. I pray, Father God, that it will help many of us just get past now and lay me down to sleep and all the little prayers we learned when we were in the sunshine band and in the little children's classes and the veggie tale prayers and just all of the preschool prayers or whatever it was, God, we have to grow from that. We have to mature. So I pray, God, that you will grow us up in this area, that we can pray to you, Father God, with authority and come before you humbly, Father God, recognizing who we are, recognizing our error and our mistakes, but most importantly, recognizing your regenerative power to restore us to the place where we can even come before you to ask certain things. And when we ask God, help our hearts that there'll be no wrath or doubting, that there will be no anger or malice, no hatred toward our brother and sister in our hearts because that will totally block the process. Father God, because we must forgive first in order to be forgiven and restored and regenerated by you. So help us, Father God, to take that posture and help us, Father God, to die every day to our will and what we want, to carry our cross, to be, humili to be in a place of uh, humiliation or humbling, to be low, brought low by the cross, by the death of our flesh, so we can come with life for our spirit. And Father God, I pray right now that this message will help people everywhere, Lord, in this time, these uncertain times, during this pandemic. Father God, that they would use this time to find you. Use this time to straighten themselves up. Use this time, Father God, to get rid of the sins of the flesh and follow after the fruits of your spirit. 
Help us, Lord, in this hour until you return for us. In Jesus' name, amen.